Production funding for this program is made possible in part by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. She's an Emmy award-winning personality. She's flown on a jetpack. You can see her on the Today Show talking technology. And we're honored to have her here in Memphis for a conversation with Katie Linendahl. So let's start. You got involved in technology at an early age, learning to code. So where did you begin this journey of technology? Yes, well, it's been a pleasure being here and the hospitality and just the kindness has been so great. So thank you all. And I look forward to already the next time I come back. Um, technology for me is a huge passion. I started when I was about 12, 13 years old coding, as you noted. And that was at a time where it was during that like AOL boom had started happening when I was about 16, 17, 18. So it was very still an early time with the, the, the excitement of technology. So it was a little ahead of the, of the curve. But it's, I always laugh, as you've heard me say, because I have an eight-year-old niece that's into coding and robotics and engineering now. And I feel like saying, I got involved when I was 12. That used to be cool. That used to be like way ahead of its time. Now I'm like, you know, three and four-year-olds doing code and robotics and engineering. It's, it's an interesting, we're getting so far so fast. Well, and already the eight-year-old is hacking into your computer she and did. you're like, that's awesome. She did. She, I, she actually popped right into my computer and figured out my password and I was so proud. <laughs> Most people will be mad and I was like, slow <laughs> clap. <laughs> <laughs> and so you were earning certificates before you even graduated high school. Talk about the journey of, of making this really a full-time profession in the sense of the education, and then we'll dive into ESPN. Yes, yeah, so it's interesting to have gotten to where I am now. I never thought I would have a world, and my passion for tech and gadgets and electronics would parlay into the TV world. I had my networking certs, as you noted, in high school, and then I got my degree in information technology, new media, from the Rochester Institute of Technology. Um, when I, where I went to school, and then I went right to ESPN and worked behind the scenes. But my degree was always in tech. I was always um, heavily involved in both hardware and software. And to think that it would come and be into, A, the consumers and, and everyday people would care so much about technology, and it was so fascinating to talk about, like, being in this world that we live in now where everybody wants the latest and greatest in tech, and, like, what I do is so cool. Like, I never foresaw that. But it's, it's amazing to actually have this true expertise and to bring it into, I call it the TV part of what I do, and having the, the blessing to work on so many great national outlets, that is really the icing on the cake. Like for me, I'm still that introverted IT person that loves to do the research and then it's the real bonus and to be able to go on TV and share that with millions of individuals watching. So let's start with ESPN, then we'll carry our way through on the fun gadgets, because you do get to play with gadgets all day, every day. Yes. But talk about ESPN, because that's a funny story on just getting into ESPN and having to take a test. And yes. What was that like? I've always been a huge sports fan my whole life, my whole family is. I feel like you're either born like a, you know, an athlete and a sports fan and really into your teams, or it's just something you're passionate in about. Boston, right? Well, I actually grew up in Erie, Pennsylvania, a very small town, and then my family all lives in Boston now. So. Uh, Go Celtics. So <laughs> the, the, it was so fun to be able to, right out of school, when I was actually in Rochester Institute of Technology, they had a program. It was the first program ever done by ESPN where they came into universities. And it was called uh, Sports Zone, and it was airing on ESPN2. And I was like, oh my gosh, what an opportunity. There's not many females at this school and not a lot of girls in technology. I'm going to be a host for this show. So there I was at 18, 19 years old, and my first foray into television was at ESPN2 hosting the show, which eventually led me to the obsession of production and, and the fascination with editing and technology and working behind the scenes. And then, to your point, I went and worked in Bristol, Connecticut, Sports Center, um, ESPN headquarters, and worked on Sports Center and Outside the Lines, NBA Fast Break. I started as a production assistant, worked my way up. And one of the favorite stories is I literally took a sports test at that time to get my job, where it was really, really hard, but I got it. So I, I feel very grateful to have worked my way up from, I mean, I started having 
freelance jobs when I was like 12 years old. I mean, we were getting after it, but it built so much character to be able to understand every different facet of production um, and being able to manage cameramen and understand how to edit so I can really be in the place that I am now and be able to understand all those roles and be able to speak to all those roles and do them too still. I think we're entering this really interesting time period with media where you have to be able to do it all. So I, I'm grateful to have worked my way up and it, it really built a lot of my character. All right, so from ESPN, what was the next step? An interesting question because actually I was working so much behind the scenes and learning from the pros. And I got to tell you, a big mentor in my life was Stuart Scott. I learned so much from him just seeing how he works on camera, on and offline. What an amazing character and a big loss. He was a great guy to, to learn from. But I wasn't there and I wasn't ready for that next progression into you know, television. I had, I had to work my way up. So from ESPN, believe it or not, my first TV gig was actually working at the Home Shopping Network, where I sold $20 million in gadgets and electronics, which million. is crazy here. And to think back, and it's such this point in my career where you'd have to be able to talk about anything from a GPS to a Nintendo, at that time it was the DS, a little mini gaming console, portable gaming console, for anywhere from, you know, a minute to an hour, nonstop. So... No script, no prompter. This is all in your head. You better be prepared. You better have an outline. But again, another amazing experience to be able to experience and work my way Absolutely. through. Absolutely. What about working, because not only technology, but ESPN, now Home Shopping Network's a little bit different, but, but very male-dominated fields. Yes. So how was that? I mean, obviously having to know the starting lineup and taking tests to get into ESPN, but yep. what was it like being, a, especially a young female, working in a traditionally very male-dominated industry? Yeah, and I find that still today in the world of technology, it's still, you know, predominantly male dominated. But I, I've always enjoyed my place in in that kind of forum. I, I feel like it, I always tell women and, and people that I mentor, it's taking advantage of it. Be, be proud of the knowledge and the expertise that you stand behind. And in whether you're female or male or no matter what you, label people want to put on you, if you have the confidence and you have the expertise, it doesn't matter. Absolutely. So I really never thought too much about it, but more so like it was kind of cool to be the only girl in all my classes. You know, I like take advantage of it. Um, it, it so it's, it makes me feel unique and I kind of look at it from a different positive point of view. So you won the Emmy at a young age, 22, right? Yes. So yes. how did that come about? I actually won my Emmy for was titled as for associate producer on SportsCenter. So my Emmy is really for behind the scenes, which I'm very proud of. Because again, I, I think, you know, having that experience to understand production and to manage so many different roles and, and work on so many different big ch uh, shows from, again, like Sports Center and the Outside the Lines, it was, it was fascinating. But also, too, you, you're busting butt. Like, it's hard role to right. be in. And what was interesting at that time period when I was at ESPN, you went through a six-month trial period. So at six months, you, you were voted on whether they were going to keep you or not. So it's a, it's... It was very stressful. I'm sensing a lot of um, pressure all the way throughout to get in, of, to stay in. <laughs> I feel like that's a trend of my life. It's just like I, I love a lot of pressure. I love being like a challenge both mentally and physically, and I, I continue to put that pressure on myself every single day. So you've done some amazing things. I, mean, I mentioned the jetpack, but you, you've gotten to experience uh, really cool things. Give us maybe one or two that stand out as just fun, amazing experiences that you've had a chance to enjoy. Oh my goodness, there's so many. You know, diving is a big part of what I do and working underwater and shooting a lot of stuff underwater is an environment that I have just become captivated by. My first foray into experiencing scuba diving and really this other world that exists under the ocean. I was like, I'm not a very emotional person, but when I was underwater for the first time and just seeing everything in kind of their ecosystem and how like it's, it's another world and how much little we have discovered from it. I really went into covering a lot of stories underwater. And uh, briefly, I can say like some of my favorites, I was uh, underwater with NASA astronauts where they're twice a year, they actually work on this program and it actually simulates microgravity uh, from at about one eighth. So they go underwater because that's as close as you can get to really having the simulation of being in space. So imagine being underwater and there's like shark, a stingray, all this beautiful <laughs> underwater life. And then there's like astronauts training and they live for six to 18 days underwater. Wow. So it's, it's these stories that you report on. And also at the same time, I was working with NASA on this particular story. And you have to understand things at a very convoluted level, but then also bring them down to 
you know, I, it was, it was, you got to keep up and, and right. process it, but bring it down where it's like exciting and the, people can understand it no matter if they're tech savvy or not. So I think, you know, the underwater stories to me is always going to be fascinating, something I'm hunting down. And one of the ones I know that you became fascinated with, but the lionfish. Yes. There's a whole environmental piece to this in terms of not only raising awareness, but using technology, obviously, is a piece of it, but, but raising awareness for the devastation that these lionfish yes. are causing. I became so obsessed with the lionfish story, and I still am, and I'm very passionate about my pieces that I don't just go and, and, and do a piece and it's like, next, I'm like, I'm all in. And sometimes in an instance where I discovered that this lionfish, and a lot of people haven't heard of it, it is a species of fish that is gorgeous. It has 18 venomous spines. It's always in a lot of cartoons because it's a beautiful fish. Um, it's native to the Pacific Ocean. And supposedly the hypothesis is that an individual, a pet shop owner in Florida, had thrown four to six lionfish in the water in the Atlantic Ocean in the 80s. Well, what happened was about 30 to 40,000 eggs they lay every four to five days, which equals That's lots crazy. of babies. Like, right. I don't know if I'm gonna have one baby one day, Lots of babies happening by the lionfish. Well, the crazy part about that is they have no predators. So I discovered this story in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean that here all these scientists are freaking out because there's this fish, this venomous species, and it has no predator, and it's eating all these fish, and the fish don't know to stay away from it. Their brains don't innately know, hey, this is a, a, a bad guy I should stay right, away they from. They do in the Pacific, but not the Atlantic. Right. So it, it became a fascinating story that I lived on and off of uh, covering in Bermuda for about, it took me months to shoot it on the island. And uh, specifically, I found it there because I was on a random trip, and I just said, here, these locals are trying to beat this problem that nobody know about. But yet, it's permeated not only through the Caribbean and South America, but all the way up into the Northeast. And it's also destroying the reefs. I mean, there's a Destroy. whole environmental As some scientists call it, it could be the biggest problem the Atlantic Ocean ever faces. Wow. And to think that this is happening right now in our time because of our irresponsibility, it's crazy. And the, the, the neatest part about it, and I'd say that neatest, but if you take all those fish, Right now, if you take any lionfish in the Atlantic Ocean, the DNA that is found from it is from four, those four to six lionfish that were let go in the 80s. Wow. So to talk about the impact of one false move, I think is something that's been very fascinating to cover. And to also, the responsibility I have as a, as a journalist to be able to share that story and get people aware of what's happening and what they can do and covering it also like, hey, here's a negative, but let's, how do we make it a positive and how do and we they're now using technology impact. to battle too. So. They're so using technology to battle. And as of recently, a big company that we know in the technology world, iRobot, they've actually been working on underwater robots to actually mass capture the lionfish. Because the only way to capture a lionfish now is to actually spearfish it, which is actually pretty hard. And you're only taking out one at a time and you can only stand underwater for so long. So it's just mind blowing the stories that you know you come across in your life. And that was challenging for me um, physically. I had to get higher dive certifications and just, I was in a lot of storms in the waters in the middle of the Bermuda Triangle uh, and learning a lot about fish that I did not know about in the ocean. And, and what again, what small move we could make could be such a destructive choice. So talk about, on your end, you get about seven gadgets, we'll say, but a day yes. that you get to try and you're yes. testing them out and you're immersing yourself in. And, you know, back to your point of viewing it as a responsibility, when you go on shows like the Today Show, you have a massive audience of millions. And so you always say it's a responsibility to, to be a uh, a good steward of the opportunity, but describe what it's like to have Definitely. seven gadgets a day. Oh my gosh. How do you manage all that? It's such an awesome problem to have. I have, you know, constantly testing, you know, upwards of 10 gadgets a day. FedEx and UPS are, are not a fan of me until holiday season and the bonuses come around. But um, it's so cool to be able to be hands on because I see this, the, every day for me is so different, whether I can be taking on a passionate story or a lot of technology and gadget roundups. So I'll go on somewhere like the Today Show and have five to nine gadgets in one segment. And people always say, oh, did you just show up with a backpack and a few gadgets? Gadgets. I'm like, if you knew how much testing I go and, and how much, how many gadgets I pitch to the team before they, they pick and choose the ones that they like, it's a lot of work. But it's super exciting to be on the forefront and really in my space and, and, and having access to gadgets before they don't come out and also finding the mom pa gadgets of like, oh my gosh, we can't believe you're actually interested in testing. Them. Like, Those are moments I'm like, yes, when you find a good one that you can put on air that people are excited by. But bringing it full circle, you bet that I'm testing for a while and putting stuff on air that I truly care about because pe millions of people are watching it and a lot of times th things sell out and that's on me. If, if they don't like the product or the product isn't great, 
come on now. So I have, I have responsibility. I know that one you do like is called Sleep Shepherd. Yes. Describe Sleep Shepherd. Sleep Shepherd, this is a really cool, I've become obsessed with the world of sleep over the last year and a half really due to this company, Mind Rocket, that created the Sleep Shepherd. It is a sleep gadget that's worn like a little comfortable headband. And inside there behind the scenes, it's created by MIT doctors and scientists, and specifically an individual, Dr. Michael Larson, who his daughter was having chronic sleep issues, like 50 to 70 million Americans. And they were putting on her on so many drugs that she ended up in the ER. And he was like, forget it. I'm taking matters into my own hands. I'm gonna create a device. And here he is now in version 2.0, with this Sleep Shepherd gadget that raised a million dollars on Kickstarter. And I became so blown away and fascinated by the gadgets. I was like, this team is incredible. They're out of Colorado and what they do and what they're so passionate about and helping people's lives and sleep, it's just been, it's been unreal this last year watching it just explode in terms of retail. And what I've been able to do is again, lend a microphone and be able to take it on national segments and say, this is a company that I'm passionate about, that I'm working with. And I think also too, to get people to perk up, we hear a lot about wearable fitness and wearable technologies, whether it's smartwatches or whether it's Fitbits, and it's a billion dollar industry, but I think sleep is that next little nugget that's gonna be added to that. It is, a, a, it's projected to be a multi-billion dollar industry in just the next few years. I think it's a component that's been missing that people are gonna be really receptive to. Like, it's a really important to get good sleep, and I don't think there's been a huge spotlight on that over the years. So in working with this company and just doing so well in terms of being able to share it nationally and also at retail, like it's it's a fun experience, but also it's helping people. Right. And like that's why, how could you not be excited by that? So you talk, you know, that's kind of the trend is sleep and wearables. Uh, another one obviously you're seeing right now is the self-driving cars and technology being used in aviation, in automobiles. Where do you stand on, on that? Because obviously there's a lot of positives. You can be working while the car drives you, but there's also right. a control issue. Right. I, I got to experience one of the coolest autonomous vehicles at the Consumer Electronics Show, which happens every year in Vegas or in January. And they, it's kind of the, the big tech companies always for, showcase what they have coming out for the next few years. And with this conversations of, of uh, self-driving cars and people being worried and, and robots and AI taking over, I had to say, I, I see the positive in it in different realms. And I like when there's the specific vehicle that I was uh, really had me perk up at the Consumer Electronics Show was one that specifically allowed for autonomous, semi-autonomous, or you're fully in control. And what was really neat about it to, to share some of the features was, for example, I'm somebody that once I start driving, 10 minutes, 15 minutes in, I'm like, oh, this is real nice. Like, not a good time to be on the road. And I do not drive a lot because of that reason. I get sleepy. Here, a feature inside that car is it actually has your biometrics, so it can tell when you're falling asleep. So what the car actually does, it has a little like kind of Siri device, if you will, in there that's a robot that you're always talking with, and it's like, it starts telling you stories if it tells that you're sleep, getting sleepy. If that doesn't work, it starts blowing wind in your face. If that doesn't work, it takes over. So I think in instances where, oh my goodness, how many accidents happen on the road from where it could be right. stopped, those are areas I see positive impact in terms of the world of like self-driving cars. I know that another big one is virtual reality. There's augmented reality, but but you work a lot in virtual reality and yes. we'll kind of transition into one of your real passions yep. as well. But but talk about virtual reality as a trend and then yep. we'll dive into that coal. I think we always see these trends in the world of tech, obviously, and VR right now is just huge. And I I have worries that it's only until you experience a true VR headset that you realize how immersive being inside this other world really is. And for me, that experience was uh, many, many years ago, I actually got to go to the birthplace of where VR was created. And they put me inside this unit and I had a, a VR headset. It was kind of more of a 4D experience because I was in a cool chair too and it was like moving around. But what was awesome about it was I was like trading on this Navy ship. And the first time I'm here experiencing this VR, I've, I forgot about everything that was happening out here. And I literally had a whole TV crew filming me and I forgot about that that, that that was happening. And I was into this world. And for me, it was like, yes, could this be very cool in gaming or being front row at a concert? But I also saw physical therapy, dentists, uh, anytime we'll, we'll talk about pediatric cancer of where I ended up bringing VR. What kind of applications can we use virtual reality, real estate, that people can save so much time or be in another, transported really into another world and, and kind of 
put everything away for a second. So that was a really impactful moment that I had. Uh, the, the remainder of that day after I first experienced VR, I was like, whoa, this is intense. I, but, but you really have to have the hardware and see a true virtual reality experience. I use examples in the past. I've, I've been diving with whales underwater with VR. Um, I've, I've seen this amazing Cirque du Soleil show where all the actors come up to you and you know your heart's racing because you feel like these like, crazy circus people are all in your space. and. The sky's the limit in terms of what you can achieve. I, I actually was at an event one time where they were doing a VR. Um, there was a, a line of people testing if they would jump off of this, this cliff or not in VR. And it was 50-50 wow. because it was so real that they were like, ah, I'm not sure I'm going to jump or I'm not, I, I am. So it's a really intense experience when you first get your hands on. And, and from there on out, I think if... If consumers take to it, which I hope, I hope it's not another 3D TV, I think it could be really incredible. Well, I think even before, you, when you talk about kind of going into the, the pediatric cancer side, is there's technology for technology's sake. Yes. But then there's technology for the greater good, right? For yes. social good. And I think when you create something in a vacuum, but then all of a sudden you realize, wait a second, you know, you've got these applications, which video games, this and that, but then you look at all these other huge opportunities over here to help people. Yes. That's a whole different ballgame you're playing now. Absolutely. And, you know, and if it takes it, it I, I tell people, too, you can show the dollars, too, in, that, in those, those sections. Absolutely. When we, we talk about real estate or we talk about healthcare, we talk about the other day I was using a VR headset while I had a four and a half hour dentist appointment that I didn't know was going to be four and a half hours. Like, these are really applications of where, yes, you can be helping people too, but if it's going to take incentive for people to perk up and know that there is a huge market for it, so be it. So talk about Batcoal. This is one that obviously it, it, it will wind up talking about virtual reality, but talk about Batcoal. Yes. So uh, one thing I'm very passionate about, I've worked for as a volunteer for six years in pediatric cancer and very intimately, I've become a big sister to five individuals that have been I've been very close with. And unfortunately, when you work in a space that is so intense, like pediatric cancer, you, I've watched many of them unfortunately pass away. And one of my little BFFs, Cole Winnefeld, he, uh, it's bittersweet because I, the last visit that I got to have with him, we were at Star Wars weekend in Disney World. And he unfortunately passed away after a six year battle with pediatric cancer. And we now have the Batcoil Foundation, which raises money for clinical trials in I educate people that clinical trials, when it comes to pediatric cancer, in my experience, I've watched so many families firsthand and been a big sister. They, having these clinical trials and maybe these one-offs that may or may not be a home run, they're very important. And they kept him alive for six healthy years. You know, not best of the best, but really good shape. So we're educating people on clinical trials, but also in terms of VR, what we're doing is when I first had that personal VR experience, I knew that this is something that the kids could be able to, while they're waiting for chemo and radiation and they have those long days in the hospital, there's nothing to do. Like what worse environment could you come up with a child to be in? And there's this downtime. And now we, with the help of the Winnefeld family who we honor in Cole's remembrance, we have been installing virtual reality headsets into the hospital. And it took a matter of trust to be able to get into the hospital because there is no hidden agenda. This is all something that we are doing firsthand. And you know we're spending money out of pocket. We just want these kids to be experiencing a different place at that time. Right. Um, but it is awesome to be able to get the honest feedback from kids of all ages to say, this is really cool. Not only am I like, maybe I'm waiting for chemo and it's a really bad day, but I'm gonna go inside VR and be able to choose, hey, I wanna be on a beach. Hey, I wanna be on a skateboard. Hey, I wanna be skiing down this, this cliff and look down and it looks like it's my point of view. Take out of that reality and, and that to me is like, I see this as the future. And I, I even recently had an experience where I was at the dentist, which is such a lower end um, example, but it was so long. It was, I was saying it was hours, and I was watching YouTube videos the whole time on a VR. Where it looked like there was a TV, a movie theater right in front of my face. That's distracting. They said I was like the best patient ever. So I'm like, I get to talk to the kids I about that. Know you're working on my teeth. Yeah, I didn't I'm even know that. Sometimes I'm here and be like, can you move a little to the? And I was like, great. This is easy. Everybody should have that luxury. And how lucky we are. So what would you tell? Because obviously everything we're talking about is not only technology, but it's technology for good. Yep. What would you tell businesses, entrepreneurs, people that say, you know, I, I want to use technology for good? What, mm -hmm. What's maybe one or two tips? I say that everybody has a skill set that we're, we all have. We all have a job, right? God willing. And with our role, we I think sometimes we undervalue how much 
power we have it as an individual. I never would have thought my world of technology would, I, doctors would be asking me, oh my goodness, this kid's getting up, he's eating, he's walking around because he has a Nintendo Switch. Like that's so cool and he's so excited. It's not hard. But I never, you realize that you have, each of us has a skill set that can help, maybe in a direct or indirect way. And I even think about, like, we talk about pediatric cancer, some of these families that I'm specifically alluding to the hospital in New York where they all come from around the world, too. They need help with their laundry. They need help running errands. They need help picking stuff up. What can we all do as an individual, not even tech savvy or not? I, I, I encourage people to look inside their own skill set. And if it's once a year, once a week, just even thinking about doing the right thing, we've made progress. Kind of on the side of, of Sleep Shepherd, but talk about balance. I think it's important because you, you can become so consumed with technology. Yes. And you see it especially now with everybody, even a family sitting there at the dinner table all on their cell phones. Yep. But uh, where does balance play into this? Balance is a huge word right now. And I'm actually, it's something I'm working on myself. And I feel like the luxury I had in growing up was having that one time period of, of, of my childhood was there wasn't that technology. So to remember what it's like to be inside your own imagination and to really have to think things through and not always be able to, I'm gonna pick up my phone. Like we're always constantly hyper-connected and tethered and I think that's phenomenal. I think all the education, all the resources are inside one little tiny device. That's an amazing place to go. But I also think that there is this connection with nature and with the world and with, um, if you are spiritual, I think we all need to take a few minutes a day at the minimum and, and kind of just sit with ourselves and our own mind without a device. And it's, again, something I'm working on, too. And I get some of my best ideas is just walking across the street without my phone. And if that freaks you out, put it on airplane mode for like five minutes. You still got the phone. Like, it's it's a really interesting time that we're creeping up on. And I also get worried, like, you know, this is my first time being an aunt. I have an eight, a five, and a three-year-old, um, two nieces and a nephew. And I'm watching how they're just growing up differently and digitally. Italy, and I'm, I'm encouraging the STEM education. The science. I want them to be ahead of the curve in science, tech, engineering, and math, and the arts. But at the same time, I, I so admire watching parents and my sister, both my sisters, do just encourage outside play and getting hands-on and the digital and the physical. Well, this is a conversation we could have for <laughs> hours and still not scratch the surface, especially on all the latest and greatest gadgets. But greatly appreciate you being here in Memphis. Greatly appreciate you sharing your story and sharing the, the latest in tech and how we can use it for social good. So Thank you. I hope to be back in Memphis your... again soon. <laughs> Thank you for joining us for a conversation with Katie Lindendahl.